we can get started here and move all of that out of the way. Okay, I'm going to talk about houseplants and hope that you can all be happy <laughs> with the house plants that you are home that you have at home. Why aren't you voting? There we go. So, what is a house plant? Um, basically, it's what you want it to be. Um, it needs to be able to grow in your house. And since most of us have houses somewhere between sixty-five and seventy-five, it makes this selection of plants um, from tropical and subtropical reason uh, regions and unless you have something big in your house, they will all grow in a container. Um, it has to fit in your house, in your space. One of the things, not only with your indoor plants, but also with your outdoor plants, is to know how big it's going to get. I can't tell you how many people go to the nursery and find this absolutely fabulous, adorable looking little plant, and they put it somewhere and it grows to be 10 feet by 10 feet. And uh, that's just not something that you need to deal with. So always know what your plants are going to do in the future. Your house has hot spots and cold spots and shady spots and sunny spots and spots that have a lot of ventilation. Uh, some places are perfect and some places not so much. It has to tolerate your watering habits. And I can tell you that I water on Sunday. That's the only day that I water. If it's been cold and damp like it has, and I look around at my plants on Sunday and I think, okay, they don't need watering this week. So then they don't get looked at until the following Sunday. On the other hand, you may want to check your plants every day. You may want to baby your plants and look at them and, and that's just fine. Um, you have to do what's going to work with you and what you're willing to do um, with your plants. Uh, what they need, number one, is circulating air. And by circulating air, I mean that they need to have enough air between the plants that you don't get too much humidity and invite insects. Um, it wants to be in its preferred temperature. We'll talk a little bit about that. Some are very, very easy to grow in the, the bright light of a kitchen window and very little light on your kitchen or dining room table. Um, you do need to feed your plants just the way you feed yourself. And we'll talk a little bit about that proper light and the proper amount of water. So challenges to keeping them alive. First, number one problem is overwatering. We're going to talk a lot about that. Uh, you look at lists and they say not enough water. That is so seldom the problem. Uh, because we overlove our plants. Putting the plant in the wrong location. Again, there are, I am, have picked the what I think are the easiest plants. But even with the easiest plants, if you put it in the wrong location, uh, there is one plant, a uh, common name is a snake plant, and I think it would grow in a closet. But it also grows in full sun outside in East County. So it's one of those that's just super adaptable. Others, not so much. Again, too little or too much humidity. If you live in East County, your humidity levels are going to be way different than if you live coastal. Too much, too little light, too hot, too cold, not enough air circulation, poor soil. We'll talk a little bit about soil. Um, and pots that are too large or too small. Um, and too much love, of course. Uh, not enough love, that's not too common. And then we're just barely going to touch on pests. Okay, you're. I hope you are comfortable at 70. And I can tell you that that's pretty much what your plants will be comfortable. And when we talk about the roots, we're also talking about the soil. And the soil temperature is not going to vary as much as the house temperature. But if your house is always 60, daytime, nighttime, you just have a cold house, then you want to get plants that are a little bit more adaptable to the colder climates. Some of the tropical plants may not do well in a house that's too cold. Um, house too hot, that usually comes with humidity, and there are a lot of plants that will do well with a little extra humidity. I'm going to get a little scientific with oxygen and sugar from photosynthetic action. And that all happens from the sun 
and the light and allowing your plant to grow. It's why most plants will not grow in your closet. Um, food. Uh, there are shelves worth of food. Um, the three main nutrients in all of your plant foods are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, commonly known as NPK. And then there's all kinds of micronutrients. You can get chemical fertilizers. You can get organic fert fertilizers. Um, whatever you want to buy is just perfectly fine. Just follow the directions on the product that you purchase. Um, if you over fertilize, it can kill the plant. And if you give it no food, your plant can die pretty much the same as you. It needs to have, for the most part, about a seven uh, on the pH. Now, our tap water in San Diego is about an eight. And so most plants like it a little bit lower. Um, so, some plants like a lot lower, but those are outside plants like your rhododendrons, your camellias, your azaleas. They like really acid. Um, hydrangeas, they change color outside based upon the acidity of the soil. But most of your house plants will do just fine on tap water. And of course, they need space to grow. They need space for the roots as well as the shoots. How do you know your plant is happy? Uh, this is a photo of my fiddle leaf fig. It is just so exciting to see new leaves come up. They come up in pairs. They generally come a pair a year, except I've gone through a two-year period where I've had two sets of two leaves. And so my plant, instead of being as tall as it is here, which is about five feet, is now about seven feet tall. And I don't know where I'm going to move it uh, because I just don't have a lot of space for an eight-foot plant. So it means it's really happy. Um, so my new leaves are growing. It flowers in season. Now, I'd like to say that every single plant flowers because they do, but you don't generally see them. I've never seen a flower on this fiddle leaf fig. Never, never seen one. Um, you want leaves to be bright, plants, stems, firm, nothing soggy, nothing smelly. Next page. Things that tell you that something is wrong with your plant. Um, it's leggy. Leggy means there's too much space between one leaf and the next leaf. Most plants want to be bushy, but if they are leggy, they are usually reaching for the sun. So you may want to put them into more light. If the new leaves are too small, again, probably means not enough light. If your leaves are droopy, wilting, falling off, as the picture I have captured here, um, you are probably overwatering it, under fertilizing it, um, have it in front of a heat register or in front of a really sunny window and it gets too hot. So again, you need to, to be careful about your location. Um, plant stem, soft and mushy, again, overwatering. And of course, what no one wants to see is anything crawling in, on, around, above, within your plant. So the big question, how often should you water? And I have the great answer for you. It depends. Um, the type of plant, the light, the temperature of your house, the amount of air circulation. Uh, if you have it in front of an open window, in front of a closed window, is it in front of a double paned closed window? Uh, what kind of soil you use? Uh, the general health of the plant and of course the season. In the summer, in the heat, most people are going to need to water a little bit more. And when it's cold and damp and wet, like it is now, they probably need a lot less. You also have to look at the type of plant that you have. If you have a stem succulent, some of the succulents do really well inside. You want to let it comply, dry completely and lots of indirect sun. Most succulents do not want to be in the full sun inside little rosette succulents, you want to let them almost dry between your watering. Your leafy plants, like the one I showed you, again, you want to water when almost dry. And orchids are an exception. They want water, they want to keep wet, and they want to keep humid. And I don't have orchids in my list of easy plants because I honestly don't find them particularly easy. I think that so much depends on the heat of your house, the light of your house, 
uh, location in your house. Um, and if you can grow orchids, yay, lucky you, because I don't have so much luck with orchids. Um, I just put a little note here for moisture meters. If you don't want to stick your finger down into your soil, um, buy a moisture meter and you can buy them at good garden centers. They're not very expensive. And when you put it in to the depth of the roots of your plant, you'll be able to find out how dry or how wet your plant is. And this might help you if you're an overwaterer. Okay, too much water. I'm really harping on this, aren't I? <laughs> because it's so often, I bet I don't see your hands, but you know, think about it. How many of you have looked at a plant, that, looked at it and said, oh, my plant, it looks terrible. Maybe I need to give it a little water. And of course, that's pretty much the end of your plant. If any time you walk by your plant and it smells, that is, you might just dump the entire plant because it's probably past its survival stage. If you really love the plant and you just really want to try to save it, pull the entire plant out of the pot, take all of the soil off and look at your roots. And the roots should be yellow or white and firm. If they are black and mushy and soggy, your plant is probably beyond its ability to be saved. If you have some good roots, you may trim off all of the dead roots, put it into new good soil and water less and hope for the best. A lot of people have been told, and again, you can find every piece of information right and wrong on the internet. So be real careful about internet information. But you hear a lot about putting rocks or debris of some variety in the bottom of your pots. And I don't recommend that because all it does is lessen the amount of space that you have for your roots to grow. And you can see by my photo exactly what I mean. So if you want to put some rocks in the saucer that you have to collect the water or to provide a little bit more humidity, that's fine. But I do not recommend putting rocks or gravel, debris, or whatever. Um, into your pots. So choosing your pot, what kind of pot do you want? Most of the pots that you should choose should be narrower at the base and taller than they are wide. And the reason for this is when you want to repot it, it will come out easier. If you have a pot that's narrow at the top, you're going to have to break your pot to get your plant out. I am going to show you a picture here of different kinds of pots. Um, clay and wood pots are usually the best because they allow for more ventilation. The clay dries out faster um, than your plastic. Your plastic obviously doesn't evaporate at all. If you have plastic pots in the full sun, it's going to get even more warm because the plastic will hold in your heat. And if your pot is ceramic and fired on the inside as well as the outside, you'll water even less. Again, there'll be no ability to really evaporate. If you have a pot that you just love because you do, and you want to put a plant in it, and this pot is narrower at the top than at the bottom, there's a really easy solution to that, is to put the plant into the plastic pot that you purchased it in and put the plastic pot inside your narrow at the top pot. And this will allow you to take it out and transplant it uh, if that's ever necessary. You can also take it out for watering. Um, and this is something that you might find these kinds of pots that have no holes at the bottom. And so it's even better to allow your plant to come out of the pot for watering. Uh, you want to have drainage in all of your pots. If you have a pot you love and it has no hole at the bottom, you can drill a hole using a masonry bit. Not a regular drill bit for wood, but you have to get a masonry bit. And a small masonry bit for the first hole and then a little bit larger. But you definitely want to have drainage in all of your pots. Now I'm going to get real scientific with you. 
um, about what's in the name. Um, we're going to talk about your family. And the family is a group of plants that all have similar flowers. They all have the same reproductive structures. And the name usually begins with a capital little letter and ends in the letters A, C, E, A, E. So we're going to carry roses throughout this. So rosaceae. Now, believe it or not, there are fruit trees, like a pear tree is in the rosaceae family. But that's because it has similar flowers. Um, the genus, that's the first part of the binomial name, the one that you will normally hear of when you go to the nursery. You'll see the genus, and then you'll see the species. And the species is kind of an interbreeding group. Um, so while we look at the genus as being a rosa, one of the species is Rosa banksia. And then because we have people who are out there doing nothing but hybridizing new plants, we now even have a variation that's called Rosa banksia lutea. And the common name means nothing because a garden rose, there's also a plant called a Lenten rose, and that's not a rose at all. So be very careful when you get to your names that when you're looking for plants, you're getting the right plant. And so many are named very poorly, botanically named very poorly. Now, the easiest house plants. You can take a screen capture of this slide if you want, or a photo of this slide. This does not necessarily all the easy house plants. These are just the easy house plants that I have selected. Most of these house plants will do really well in most locations in most homes. So that's how I decided that I was going to talk about this. So this is one of the most common ones. It's Chinese evergreen. One of these days I'm going to look up and find out exactly how these common names are given. I don't know why it's called a Chinese evergreen. I, I don't know. Um, but this is a very common plant. It's very easy to grow. It comes in all kinds of different colors. They used to be almost all green and green spots. And now they have reds and greens and all kinds of colors. Super easy. This plant will get to be maybe two feet wide and maybe three feet tall. Maybe. A ZZ plant. This is in the classification of a succulent, because succulent is not a, a family, a genus, or a species. It's a type of plant that requires very little water. If you have this plant in a nice, airy place in your house, um, like I talked about, you might water this once a month. So this is a super easy plant that you can go on vacation. You don't want to water it or it will die. Real easy plant. Cast iron plant. Well, it's got its name because it probably is really hard to kill. Um, it does want regular water. It will grow almost anywhere in very dim light, in very high light. Uh, really easy one. Again, they have hybridized all different stripes and color. Not all different colors. I think they're all green, but they do have different variations um, on their leaf structure. Again, this is likely to be not more than three feet tall and not more than about two feet wide. Spider plant, super easy plant. This you can make a hanging plant and called the spider plant because its flowers come out on these very long spindly stems. Super easy. Up, oh, trash truck is coming if you're hearing. <laughs> okay, pothos. That's another really super easy plant to grow, and they've hybridized it out to come in all kinds of different fancy green uh, variations. This can be a hanging plant, uh, or you can put it on your desk. If it grows too long, just cut the long stems off and stick them back in the pot, or get a new pot and put them in. Easy, easy to grow, it will grow very well in dim light. Uh, it's a great plant for your desk. Again, super easy. Philodendron. 
philodendrons are beautiful plants. They can grow to be six feet tall, three feet wide. Uh, they come in different variations of the leaf formation. The monstera and the philodendron are really, really similar looking plants with all of the same uh, sizes and, and requirements for uh, regular water, regular fertilizer. Um, it wants medium to high light. And again, very nice big plant that will grow tall. Anthurium. Anthurium is one of them that it is the botanic name is Anthurium. This is the genus name. They have now hybridized these in almost black and white and pale green. And of course the common one is red. Um, just a little botanic information is that the tall skinny thing in the center is called a spadix and the flat red or white or dark thing is called a spathe. I hope I didn't mix those two up. Um, and you can buy these at Trader Joe's. Uh, they cost, you know, 10, $12. They are, they will provide color in your house for years. Really, really nice. But just for fun, I have a picture here of a different anthurium. This was taken at San Diego Botanic Garden, and we have one in the conservatory. And that squiggly, curly little green thing is also the spadix. It starts out being straight. And over about a month's time, it gets curly like this. That purplish, curvy little thing is the, the spathe the flat thing that was white or red in the previous picture. These leaves are really long and skinny, about two feet long, maybe three to four inches wide. It's just a different species of anthurium, but I think it was kind of cool, so I included it. it you're never going to find this. Oh, well, you could buy it online probably, but this is not your common easy house plant. Just something to show you. Okay, a peace lily, another very easy, very good house plant, grows to be maybe two to three feet tall and maybe 18 inches wide. It flowers profusely, just like in this photo, um, if it's happy. And if it's not happy, you don't get the flowers, but you still get the flourishing green, commonly uh, called a spath. So if you were to go to your nursery and just ask for a spath, they would know what you were talking about. But the peace lily is, is the common name. Dumb cane. Uh, this, you can probably guess how it got its common name. If you eat it, it is going to do something to your mouth and to your vocal cords. So while I would never recommend eating any part of any of the plants that I'm showing, or for that matter, any other plant, unless it is considered an edible plant, and I'm not showing any edible plants. Um, this is one that you really don't want to have if you have cats or dogs that dig up and chew on your plants or grandchildren, um, because this one is a little bit more toxic than, than most of the others that I'm, I'm talking about. Again, they've hybridized all different kinds of colors, all greens, but different stripes and patterns and, and, and pretty things like that. This plant is likely to be um, three feet by three feet. Palms. Uh, you're probably all more familiar with the California fan palms and the Mexican fan palms, which are outside. But these are nice little palms that will grow in your house. I have on the left a parlor palm. And on the right, I have an areca palm. And in the middle, I have a ponytail palm. The ponytail palm is not a palm. Again, a really, I don't know why they chose the name, maybe because it might look like a palm, but it's a Bocarnia recurvata. It holds most of its water in that big fat caudex, which is the name of the brown thing that you can see just above the soil. It gets bigger and bigger. You can grow this outside. You can make it a bonsai and grow it in a pot. 
If you go up to San Diego Botanic Garden, you'll see one that's about mm, maybe eight feet wide and 10 feet tall. So keeping it in a pot, you can keep it very well sized in your house and you can watch the codex grow. Again, because it has a codex, it doesn't want water very often. This is another water every month kind of plant, but not a palm. Here's the one I was talking about. That's a Sansevieria, has lots of names like mother and lost tongue, snake plant. Uh, comes in different varieties, different shapes. They will grow in your closet. They will grow in your garden. Um, again, this is a water once a month or less plant. A rubber tree. There was a song. Once there was a rubber tree plant. Um, they come again in different sizes, um, different colors, different varieties. They can stay small or they can get very tall. The plant that I showed you that was in my house that's now about seven feet tall is also a type of ficus plant. And uh, easy to grow. I don't know why it's called a rubber tree plant. The leaves are moderately thick, but they're not like a succulent, uh, but got a name. Okay. And then there's the very easy, this is a succulent, uh, Christmas cactus, Easter cactus, Thanksgiving cactus. They have all kinds of different names, come in all kinds of different colors. These will grow very well inside. They can be hanging plants or in a pot. Um, I have one um, that I think is a Christmas cactus. And it's blooming now. It, it wants to bloom most of the year. Uh, again, one, because it's a cactus or a succulent, not a cactus. It, uh, it's really a succulent. Uh, it gets watered maybe once a month in my house. So those, those are my list of, of easy plants. So now that you have these thriving plants in your home, you're going to want to wonder when you should transplant them and what size pot to put them in. In general, they like to be just a little bit root bound. And so if you buy it at the nursery, I would probably not consider transplanting it for a year, especially if you're going to a good nursery. Um, if you really want to put it in that pot that you just purchased, make sure the pot's not much bigger, probably not more than an inch bigger, than the size pot that you purchased it. So if you're buying a four inch plant, you can easily put it in a four inch pot um, that you like. If you want to transplant it, you want to wait until you see roots coming out of the bottom, or if it's in a plastic pot, the plastic is starting to bulge um, because you want they don't want to have too much space. Best time to do it is at the beginning of their season. And so that's usually going to be early spring through midsummer. You do not want to do it during a Santa Ana. You don't want to do it when we're having one of our typical or atypical heat spells. It's too much of a transplant shock. You don't want to do it if it's the plant is wet. For example, it's raining here, probably raining at your house, and you bought a plant and you left it outside and it's real soggy. You don't want to do it when it's real soggy because it's too easy to compact all of the roots. You can do succulents depending on whether they are winter dormant or summer dormant. You want to do it at the, again, the beginning of their growth period. Leafy plants, again, you can do spring through summer. And a little bit about soil. You can use... Any soil that you purchase as potting soil from the nursery, you can buy cheap potting soil, you can buy expensive potting soil, buy what you want. Um, but you never want to use your outside in the garden soil. And you don't want to buy anything that is purely not soil. That doesn't make sense. But you can buy things that are all core. C-O-I-R. You can buy things like bark, which are perfect for your orchids. But for regular houseplants, you want regular 
potting soil. It, uh, it, I lighten my soil up a little bit, but I have a lot of succulents and things that need to have a little more air. If you want to lighten up your soil, if you're a little bit of an overwaterer, you can lighten it up with perlite or vermiculite. Those are two easy products to purchase at, at your garden center and add anywhere from four to one soil to lightening mix to half and half soil and lightening mix to give your roots a little bit more air. And I think that's always a good thing to do for my plants. I'm gonna talk just a little bit about pests. Um, these are common pests and problems that you're gonna find on your house plants. And I'm gonna touch them very, very briefly because I could spend an entire hour just on these. Fungus gnats are my biggest problem. Fungus gnats are almost like the little things that down the south they call noceums. Here we call them fungus gnats. They're tiny, tiny little guys, um, maybe an eighth to a sixteenth of an inch. Sometimes it's just like you catch something on the corner of your eye and you kind of wave at it to try to get rid of it. You can't figure out what it is. They're very similar to fruit flies. Fruit flies are a little bit bigger. Uh, fungus gnats are a little smaller. I find the best cure for fungus gnats is buying a product that's called Mosquito Bits, B-I-T-S. And you can buy those from Amazon. You can buy those at a good nursery center and follow the directions. You can put them on the top of your soil and just use your finger and dig them in a little bit. And what they do is prevent the larva, the immature stage of an insect. They prevent the larva from maturing into an adult fungus gnat. So you can buy that. Again, follow the directions. You also can get rid of fungus gnats by watering only from the bottom instead of watering from the top. Because the fungus gnat larva live in the top inch or so of your plant, when you water from the top, they're getting all of the water that they need. When you water from the bottom, you dunk your pot into a few inches of water. It will soak up into the roots, but not be at the top. You can also buy a product called horticultural sand and put anywhere from a half an inch to an inch of the horticultural sand on the top of the soil. And again, the gnat larva can't live in the sand. So those are three methods for your fungus gnats. Mealybugs. Mealybugs are little white little creatures and they can get onto your plant. They can suck the juices out of your plant. And what you'll find is white spots. They don't do holes in your plants, but they'll just find white spots. They will very often be right where the stem joins into the main stem, the, the, the leaf stem where it attaches to the main stem of your plant. You'll find them. And they're maybe a third of an inch. And what I do is I take alcohol, denatured alcohol, your 70% run-of-the-mill alcohol on a Q-tip and I touch the bug and it just desiccates in front of you. It turns black, it's gone. Um, you can also take a, the same alcohol on um, a cotton ball and rub the leaves if you see a lot of them. Um, something else you can do. Aphids, well, aphids. If the plant is a strong type plant, the type of plant that you can take outside and spray with a whole lot of water, that usually will make all the aphids drop off. They're very, very fragile little creatures. When they drop off, they will die. And so that's something that you can do. Scale is one of the hardest insects to get rid of. Scale looks like a brown bump on the main stem of your plant. When you take your fingernail and you push at it, it doesn't come off. 
And that's because it the little bug will take its six legs and embed them into the stem and then use its little tongue to suck out the juices of your plant. And so you can use your fingernail and you can scrape them off, or you can use some horticultural soap or um, some you know, organic product um, if you need to. Uh, there's things like spinosa that might work on that. And that's an organic product. Again, be careful with organic products. They are safer and than chemical products, uh, but they still need to be used with caution. Hopefully you don't get white fly because white fly in your house is very hard to get rid of because as soon as you try to treat them with something, they fly away and come back. So you really want to try to not have white fly. If you do, you may want to take your plant outside, leave it alone for a little while so the white flies come back, and then take it with insecticidal soap or horticultural oil or one of those kinds of products that will grow, uh, that will kill, hopefully kill your insects. Powdery mildew is another problem. Powdery mildew is white and fuzzy, and it's definitely as a result of too much moisture. And so more air circulation will really help with that. Um, root rot, again, I think I've covered root rot. Um, so on to the next slide. Whatever product you purchase, organic, chemical, whatever, follow the directions. The label is the law, and I can't say it often enough to follow the directions. Putting too much of a product on, mixing it at too much strength would be pretty much like making a cake and because you like sweets, putting in an extra cup of sugar. It's, it's not going to make that cake work very well. And if you double the dose, it could likely kill your plant. Um, people talk about making their own insecticidal soap by just taking some dish soap and water. Well, the problem with your dish soap is it's probably detergent-based because most dish soaps are. And I'm not going to recommend you put any detergent on your leaves because it removes what's called the cuticle, which is just a protection that the leaves have. And you destroy that with a detergent product. In addition, when you buy insecticidal soap that is made to be a plant product, it will have something in it called a surfactant. And a surfactant helps the product stick to the leaves. And so I really encourage you to follow the label of whatever product that you are going to purchase. Okay, so how do you prevent some of these problems? Well, first of all, you don't want to bring a buggy plant home. If you go to a reputable nursery, your chances are way less of getting any kind of buggy plant, but inspect the plant. Look at the joint where the plant comes in, the leaf comes in contact with the stem, and when the stem comes in contact with the main stem. Look to see that there aren't any ants in the soil. Ants don't honestly cause a problem to your plant. The problem with ants is that if you have other insects like aphids, the ants will move the aphids around because the ants, like the honeydew, the sweet secretion that these insects like mealybugs and aphids will leave on the plant. When you have this sweet liquid on your plants, it then encourages sooty mold, which is a fungus. And you can see this more outside than inside. But having no ants is one of the best ways to prevent this problem with sooty mold. Um, quarantine new plants. Put them away from your existing plants. Make sure that when you put your plants together that none of the leaves touch so that any insect will not crawl from plant number A to plant B. Abuse only clean pots and potting soil if you want to 
have a, a plant that died, but you love the pot, you can clean that pot, pot um, to soak it in something like vinegar and water or good soap and water, put it out in the sun to kill anything that might be there. Um, and then it should be clean and safe for you to use again. I don't encourage you reusing potting soil, especially if you had a dead plant. Why take a dead plant soil and potentially contaminate your new plant? So new potting soil and clean pots. Um, and inspect the leaves every time you water, every day, every week, whatever it is. Look at your plants. Make sure that things are looking really good. Okay. Um, eliminating bugs. Again, a slide that you can take a picture of or whatever if you want this, um, especially for the very last one there. Um, pick them off, rub them off, use a Q-tip and alcohol, strong spray of water, insecticidal soap, also horticultural oil. In addition, the Master Gardeners, which I didn't tell you much about, is a fabulous organization. The home Master Gardener University is Davis, University of California, Davis, UC Davis. And they do all of our research. There is so much research going on and you can find everything you want to know, I think, um, by going to our site. And because you're UC, you should already know how wonderful the UC uh, research is. We have pest notes. And there are hundreds of pest notes. All you have to do in your search page is put in UC Davis, because I think that's the easiest thing to remember. If you're really good and have a pen, you can put down UCANR, which stands for Agriculture and Natural Resources, and put in the pest. So you can put in you can UC Davis, aphids, UC Davis gophers, UC Davis roof rats. You want to know more about your plant? UC Davis camellias, UC Davis citrus. It is everything that you can possibly imagine and even more. You want to know what kind of problems? We now have a monthly proper term. Get up and get my... We have a new one that's called Seasonal Landscape IPM Checklist, which I think is absolutely fabulous. Um, you can check on the month, and each month it will tell you what you should do to your indoor plants as well as your outdoor plants. And I bookmarked that, and I just think that's a really nice one to see what's going on in your house garden. I already mentioned once about being aware of what you read on the internet. As you all know, everything is not correct on the internet. And this was on Instagram uh, or Facebook, one of those things. Um, and it's photo credit to Reddit. And if you can read what I have, the arrow, it's a sago palm. Now, I can't imagine how anyone could grow a sago palm in their house. Um, you've seen them outside. They can grow to be 10 feet wide and six feet tall with big, gigantic seed uh, pods that they put out. This is just not an appropriate plant. Um, the rest of their plants are just fine, but it, it, you just... Research well. There's a lot of information about poison plants. I talked about the dumb cane. If you ever have a question about a plant, uh, your pet ate it, uh, your grandchildren are chewing on it, please, there's many, many different resources that you can find uh, to find out what, if anything, you need to do. It would be a great generality to say that all plants have at least one part that would not be healthy for you to eat, whether it's the root, the stem, the flower, or the fruit. Uh, so we don't want to eat them and want good resources for finding out. So just a little bit of a review here is you want to let your 
roots breathe. You want to understand your plant's rights, right place, right temperature, right humidity, the right pot. When you water, water thoroughly. If you can, take your plants to your sink and let the water run through and drain. And that's way healthier than giving it little tiny little bits of water. If you have all of your plants in saucer and there is water at the bottom, make sure that you don't allow that water to stand because all it does is attract mosquitoes. Mosquitoes lay their larva. The larva then breed into uh, full mosquitoes and then you have a real a problem with mosquito diseases and all of that. Um, fertilize, whatever fertilize that you purchased, uh, fertilizer that you purchase is follow the directions. Uh, flush the soil well, especially when you give your plant just sips of water, you're going to see salt build up because of the salts that we have in our nasty water here in San Diego. And so by flushing your soil, bringing your plant to the sink or out to your patio or your front and really occasionally flush your soil really well to get rid of all the salts quarantine new plants and fix one thing at a time. You can't try everything at once so you won't know what's wrong with your plant. If after all of this, you still can't find a plant that works in your house, this <laughs> these kits are put out by Lego and they're expensive. Some of them are up to about $200, but they will never die. You may have to dust them occasionally. And here's three of their newer sets, all put out by Lego. Uh, so I thought that was pretty funny. Uh, you can read this as I summarize. Um, thank you very much for letting me talk to your group. I hope that I answered some of your questions uh, about how to make your pl house plants thrive in your house. Uh, I have just a couple of credits. Um, places that I took information. Again, there's just all kinds of wonderful information out there. And do do more credits. Uh, this is just an example of one of our pest notes. Uh, I think I gave you this one on houseplant problems, which is really good. And with that, I think I have time for questions. And so I'm going to stop sharing. Go up here and stop sharing.